everybody. We should have just started our Facebook feed for this episode of Tales from the Heart, a live podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association featuring yours truly, Lisa Salberg, and my co-host today, Dr. Harry Lever of the Cleveland Clinic. And today um, we are going to be, we're live at about 11, 10 a.m. We're a little late today, sorry. Uh, 10, 11, 10 a.m. East Coast time. If you're watching us live, you will have the opportunity to ask questions live. We will respond to as many questions as we possibly can. Um, if you're watching afterwards and have a question, please post your question and a member of the HCMA team will respond to you or forward your question back off to Dr. Lever. So um, Dr. Lever, good morning and thank morning. you for joining us. So today we are going to do a little bit of a deep dive on the topic. Um, in the past two podcasts, we've talked to patients and followed their journey. Today, we're going to take a dive into the medications used in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, why they're used, when they're used, and when you might want to talk to your team, your hopefully your HCM expert team of physicians about maybe changing your medications, um, upping doses, lowering doses, changing classes of medications, et cetera. Um, in this podcast, we will also do a little touch on COVID at the end, just little updates that we have. So stay with us and you're gonna get some uh, education and information. I'm gonna do my stop screen share now. So you'll actually see Dr. Lever and I in big pictures here. So we're going to actually have Dr. Lever present some slides today. First, I'll ask you this question and we'll kind of start the topic. In HCM, historically, we have borrowed medications from other forms of cardiovascular disease, heart disease. We are working on some labeled indication drugs. We're not gonna really dive into those today. We're gonna talk about what's on market, what's available currently. Um, so what classes of medication are we primarily dealing with, Dr. Lever? We, we deal mainly with beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Uh, there's another uh, drug that we use, uh, disapyramide, uh, that helps to reduce the gradient. That's sort of one off to itself, but it's mainly, mainly uh, calcium channel blockers and uh, uh, beta blockers that we use. And uh, over the years, mainly the highest number of drugs have been beta blockers, but second being calcium channel blockers. So what I was hoping we'd be able to do today is help explain to people what these classes of drugs are and why they're important in HCM. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen, right, I know you have some here. slides to present to us today that'll help illustrate the story. While I know we're doing podcasting here, if those of you who are listening to the podcast Can you, after, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. For you those can see watching, them now. Yep. Okay. For those okay. watching after, you can view them on the Facebook page or you can go to our YouTube channel and watch this live uh, videotaped or videotaped. I keep saying videotaped lately, uh, showing my age. Uh, but you can watch the slides on YouTube. Okay, so Dr. Lever, I'm gonna right. hand it off to you. So why don't we do right. a little bit of explanation of anatomy and then- Yeah, the that's that, yeah. all right. So this one slide I'm gonna show you is what we typically see in a patient with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We're not going to go through all the anatomic subgroups. This, this one with there's very severe uh, hypertrophy here. The mitral valve is coming up and it hits the septum. We call that SAM, S-A-M, systolic anterior motion, which then tends to block the blood from getting out of the heart here. And uh, and this is, this is what we call left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. There are, again, other types, but this is the main one that in terms of understanding we, how we can talk about the use of drugs. So far, there have been no controlled trials, except now we are with a new drug, which I'll mention at the end, there are randomized controlled trials of this drug, Mevacamptin. This is this basic, to be honest with you, this is probably the first trial ever to be done using uh, 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 drugs to treat hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are no drugs that have been released though that are on the market that have been, that have been uh, subjects of controlled trials till this one. So 
the, the ma main medical treatment tend to be what we call negative ionotropes. That means drugs that decrease the contractility of the heart a bit. They tend to beta blockers, here's the disapyramide, and then calcium channel blockers. Now, uh, the most common beta blockers are metoprolol tartrate, which is a tends to be a short acting drug. Uh, Half-life is about six to eight hours. So usually people that are on this drug have to take it three times a day. The toprolol succinate is a long acting drug and many people can get away with taking it once a day. Um, sometimes it's needed twice a day, but many people can take it once a day. Atenolol or tenormin is another longer acting drug. Parvatolol is a drug that we use in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other cardiomyopathies that in some people, it's helpful because it controls their rhythms. It also has some effect uh, if they have what we call dilated cardiomyopathies. And that we tend to use that drug more in those types than in the, than in the um, hypertrophic types. Now, beta blockers decrease contractility, that is the force of contraction. They, increase the, they can increase the left ventricular volume a little bit. They're less effective if there's truly severe resting obstruction. They're particularly helpful if there's provocable obstruction, but they do work in resting obstruction. There's little effect on diastolic function and they uh, slow the heart rate. In some patients, we have to use high dose beta blockers. Now the symptoms they relieve are chest pain or angina, shortness of breath. And some people may help if there are passing out episodes and there's been some question over the years if there's any benefit in sudden death, and that's become less important uh, since we now use ICDs if we're worried about sudden death. Now, disapyramide is this other drug that sort of stands off by itself. It clearly decreases the force of contraction. It definitely increases ventricular volume. It decreases the gradient, but its effect may not last. And it does have a side effect. It's called a, a rhythm called torosade de point, which is an abnormal ventricular rhythm and can be very serious and can cause, even can cause sudden death in some patients. But if we start the disapyramide, we usually start it in the hospital to make sure that this doesn't occur. And there's some signs on the electrocardiogram that we can look for that can give us, it's called the QT interval. That's the, the distance between the the, the, on the electrocardiogram, from uh, there's an interval that we measure, which I don't actually have a slide of right here, but if, if that is prolonged, then we get worried that this rhythm can occur. Now, the uh, now let's go back. Now, let's quickly talk about verapamil. That's a calcium channel blocker. It is, increases coronary blood flow, reduces the... Uh, it, it helps to reduce the problem with reduced blood supply to the heart. It reduces ventricular rate synergy, or it helps to improve the contraction pattern of the heart, and it may reduce uh, inter, uh, coronary calcium. Now, its mechanism of action is it slows the heart rate. It, it decreases the contractility a bit. It helps to relax the heart, improves the filling dur during in, in the resting phase, and it's available in a sustained release form. Now, I have to tell you, there's one problem with this drug now. It's only being made by one manufacturer that's coming from India, and it's not one of my favorite ones, and that's caused us some difficulties in using it. So there's another drug called diltiazem or cartazem, which effect is, is similar, and just over the years was never widely used, but I think now it's getting more use than ever before. And that's this one here. Again, there are not many studies of the drug, but it does clinically work well. It's well tolerated. And it's another option, I say, for verapamil. <coughs> it's clearly a very good substitute for beta blockers in people that have asthma. You know, people with uh, asthma do, sometimes do not tolerate beta blockers. So that, that is a, a good substitute. Amiodarone is another drug that is used to treat heart rhythm dis dis 
disorders associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's very effective in, in uh, treating atrial fibrillation and what we call ventricular tachycardia. It blocks potassium channels, but it's a very toxic drug. And we try to minimize its use. Uh, we use it frequently after surgery when people have septomyectomies if they have atrial fibrillation, and we try to stop its use within three, six, six weeks to three months. There are some people that need it longer term. And if they are, we try to get the dose as low as possible. And the, the toxic effects can be on the thyroid. It can cause hyper or hypothyroidism that is overactive or underactive. It can cause liver disease and it can cause pulmonary disease where there is pulmonary fibrosis or scarring. So we try to minimize it. Not that we won't use it, but we try to we try to really keep the dose low if we really feel that we need it. And this is the new drug. It, it tends to modulate the interaction of the muscle proteins acting in myosin. It decreases the contractility and it decreases outflow tract obstruction. And it does improve diastolic filling. And if in if 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 released by the FDA and the studies look, they are looking good. This may be a real addition to the treatment of this disease. And we'll just have to see. It's still a little bit early. You know, we're, we're all talking about early studies these days when we're talking about <laughs> this virus and all these kind of things. So people are getting, there are what we call stage three trials for Mevacamptin. So everybody knows what stage three trials are nowadays that we're talking about vaccines. So it, it's in that sort of that classification. And I think it's getting close to getting onto the market. And it's going to make a, a good addition. So that's, that's what I got. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. When as a clinician, in your 40 plus years of experience, when would you start to use a beta blocker as your first line medication for somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Are you waiting? for them to complain, and I use that term very nicely, about symptoms? Or are you more likely to preemptively use medications to try to alter the heart rate or the... the I tend to, well, people come to me, sometimes they, they come to me because uh, uh, they have an abnormal electrocardiogram or, and then they get an echo and it's found to be abnormal, uh, but they have no symptoms. So in a situation like that, I'll uh, check their heart rhythm. We'll do a, you know, we do a stress test. We want, want to see what, what their exercise tolerance is and all that stuff. We check their heart rhythm. For years, we've been doing um, um, halter monitors that are for, two, for two days, but now we have other devices that can go up to a month if necessary. Um, usually now we're going about two weeks and we monitor the rhythm before we would start anything. So we get all the baseline stuff. And I, I have a low threshold for starting the drugs. I think that we do want to keep the heart rate slow. And even if, if we don't find anything on the monitoring and, and you know, uh, I, I tend to start a, a beta blocker, maybe in a low dose and watch the patient. Clearly, if they're having symptoms of shortness of breath or chest pain, uh, then we'll uh, uh, we'll start the drug. So, of all of the patients that you saw over the years, would it be fair to say that in the neighborhood of ninety percent of your patients were on at least one medication? Yes, I think that's true. Okay. So, when would you think of using um, a calcium channel blocker over uh, a beta blocker? Over the years, we've tended to use ch calcium channel blockers as second line drugs, tending to use them. Uh, if the beta blockers weren't tolerated or there was a contraindication uh, uh, like asthma. Um, uh, but now we've got this pro one problem with, with the, the verapamil, which was the first one actually uh, out on the market. And unfortunately now it's only this one manufacturer and it's one that I've had difficulties with in terms of other drugs and it's made me a little worried about using it. So I'm tending to use more diltiazem, which actually has been pretty well tolerated. There are a number of manufacturers that make it and they seem, you know, the, the patients seem to be doing okay with it. 
So let me ask you a follow-up question there. If somebody has been taking rapamil for years and they're having a problem getting the drug in their particular location, uh, there may be a shortage or it right. just may not be as regularly available. Is it reasonable for them to look at switching to dilatizum yes. instead of? Yes, 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 yeah. Yes. So they're in the same class. They should operate similarly. Right. The doses right. may look different, right. but it's okay. That's right. Okay. Then when would you consider a dual therapy with a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker? What would well, that when, when patients are not doing well? You know, and if they're having more symptoms, can't control the heart rate, then we would add that to it. And, you know, uh, if we're starting to see patients having more symptoms and we're adding a second drug, then we're, and if they have outflow obstruction, we're thinking about operating and, and doing surgery. Unless, unless they're elderly, they have uh, other, other problems, then we might think about an alcohol septal ablation. But but we tend to go try to do surgery. You know, we try to do surgery if we can, if the patient is significantly symptomatic. The other thing I will tell you is, and there isn't tremendous data for this, but this is sort of what I've uh, approach I've taken in the past few years, is if I see a patient coming into me with atrial fibrillation, and they are having pro problems with that. I, that will push me to surgery a lot sooner. And at the same time we operate on the, the obstruction, mm -hmm. we will do something to the left atrium to decrease the size, or um, we would, at the same time, we block off that, what we call the left atrial appendage, which is a sac that sits off of the left atrium so that patients don't get clots in there and have a stroke. So, so we're, we're tending, and, and I'll tell you, now it's getting to the point that if I if somebody comes to me, I've been following them along for a while, they were doing all right and suddenly going to atrial fibrillation, that's pushing me as an indication to do surgery. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm going quicker to surgery if I see the atrial fibrillation. So let's talk for a minute about the non-obstructed population, a little bit less in the toolbox to work with. Right, um, right. I will give a teaser out there. I haven't even talked to you about this yet. We've spoken to a new company this week that's looking to start a uh, stage two trial in a new medication specifically for the non-obstructed. Stay tuned for more information there. But in the toolbox right now, how do you use drugs differently in those with um, non-obstructive HCM? Well, if they're truly non-obstructive and we can't, we can't, uh, you know, uh, uh, induce obstruction, uh, we'll try to use the beta blockers, see how they feel. And if, if, if uh, they're still having shortness of breath, then we use other drugs that we call afterload reducers that would cause the ventricle to uh, dilate a little bit and, and decrease the pressure in the, in the heart in terms of if there, some of these patients with, 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 um, non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can start getting increase in pressure in the lungs. So we try to take some strain off of that heart and use these drugs that are like vasodilators. They're called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. And we'll tend to use that if they can't, you know, if the, if the beta blockers don't work. So there's not a ton in the already existing toolbox for the non Just one second. And there's there's not a lot for the patient population in general. We do have these oncoming drugs that we're hoping will work. Um, what we need to realize is there's not a lot in the toolbox. But patients generally aren't particularly happy with some of the side effects of these medications. Beta blockers can be really tough. They cause fatigue weight gain, lethargy, brain fog, they have all these potential side effects. If a patient is really battling between the symptoms of HCM and the side effect of medication, what should they tell their physician and how should this physician alter the medical management to hopefully improve quality of life? Well, I think that uh, sometimes 
sometimes it, it just depends. Sometimes they need less dose of the medication. Sometimes they need more actually. Sometimes we've got to make sure that the pharmacy hasn't changed the manufacturer on them, that, that maybe the drug isn't working so well because uh, it's made by a manufacturer who doesn't really know how to make the drug, and that, that's a problem. So it, it's, it's sort of, you've got to go through those different things. So it would be wise if somebody were to be pretty stable and their symptoms pretty stable for a while, they notice a change in their symptoms or how they're responding to a drug because you and I have discussed this before and we're not going to get into a whole conversation on it now, but suffice to say, generic drugs do not have to be 100% equivalent. They can That's be true. as low as 75% or as high as 125%. Right. So if you're noticing side effects of the med, you may be getting a higher dose. Right. And if you're noticing your symptoms coming back in, you may be noticing it's a lower dose in that same 25 milligram or 50 milligram tablet. Right. Right. So the first thing we encourage patients to do is be their own detective. When did it start? Was there a change? Go back and look. So that's step one. If everything is equal and the manufacturer is not the problem, the drug's not the problem, but the patient's symptoms are changing, then additional assessment would be assessed. well then we would you know we'd look again to make sure that they haven't changed that the obstruction hasn't happened you know that, that because there are patients i've seen over time who do develop obstruction that what they didn't have before and you know and if in that case maybe we need more medicine if if it doesn't look like the, the beta blocker is going to help if that's what they've been on then we might change them to a calcium channel blocker like Diltiazem now and see how they do with that. And, and um, so that's, you know, if, if it, and sometimes we try both drugs if we have to. Uh, sometimes there are, there are other beta blockers we didn't mention and maybe we'd even try them. But most of the time, if the metoprolol doesn't do it, most of the others aren't going to do it either, but it's worth a try. So a lot of this is trial and error to find the person's individual cocktail that works best for them. That's right. And it can be from the patient perspective, I can assure you, it can be frustrating at times to have to balance these medicines and find out where it's going to work. And things change over time. You know, we're, we're dealing with the human body over decades of life. So if a patient starts on a beta blocker in their 20s, there's a high likelihood they're going to add something or delete something in the future. Would that be correct? Yep. Yep. That's right. So we do have a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to pivot to, um, and I'm going to ask the question as it was asked, Jane asks, is it true that calcium channel blockers are not good for HCM with atrial fibrillation? No, that's not true. So I think that they, they would, I mean, again, it, the whole situation of the atrial fibrillation is uh, um, you got to know, did they just develop atrial fibrillation? Uh, you know, is, do they have chronic atrial fibrillation? But, but no, uh, the calcium channel blockers, the uh, part of Diltiazem, not a, no, it's not that it's bad for atrial fibrillation at all. Okay, so in, in an individual though, maybe it wasn't a good mix. And that's an individualized thing. Right. Most, in my experience of 25 years dealing with 15,000 families with HCM and yours 40 years dealing with lots of HCM patients through the Cleveland Clinic, one thing is sure that it's very hard to find two people that are identical. That's exactly right. No two people are the <laughs> oh, same. Yeah, there's a couple of them that I have like, wow, you guys are like really mirror image. But the majority of people each have their own underlying genetics and metabolisms of medications that may make things work slightly differently for their anatomy. So right. there's not a playbook on you use this to this dose and this much. It's very individualized. Now, the next question that comes in is um, a bold one and I'll, we'll both take it. Um, and I'm reading it as is, Mavicamptin is going to be a breakthrough drug in the world of HCM. I could be wrong in saying that it will be the mother drug in this class. When is it possible to get to see it get to market? I'm going to start and then I'm going to ask you for your input here. 
cautious optimism is a wonderful thing, but unbridled enthusiasm is dangerous. So by saying that, we can look at the data and say, this new class of drug, a myosin modulator, a myosin inhibitor, mavicamptin, holds promise for a group of patients with HCM, specifically up front, probably the obstructed group with a particular anatomy yet to be exactly defined, but it has not been submitted to the FDA as of yesterday. Um, I don't know about today, but as of yesterday, it hadn't been submitted yet. And there are some real differences in how this drug will be dosed because it needs to be echocardiographically driven so once you go on it, you need to have an echo as a follow-up. And this may be an area that the FDA finds a little cumbersome and it may be a little bit problematic and we may need to work with them to get through how to dose people with this particular drug. So there are some hurdles still to get through. That's part of the process. Doesn't mean anything's bad. It just means it's a process. If it comes to market, which many of us suspect that it will, you're probably looking at a year or so down the line for general accessibility. And then we get to start battling whose insurance company is gonna pay for it and whose isn't and how do people get access. There's a lot of other downstream issues. It's not gonna show up and be on the shelf tomorrow for anybody with HCM who wants it. And I actually do hope that there's something in the labeling that makes sure that those who actually know the disease best are the ones prescribing it up front until we learn a little bit more. So um, Harry, what do you think about well, the- Well, I, I, when a new drug comes out over the years, I've never been the first one to recommend it. And I think that, you know, we got to do it slowly. We got to be careful. There are some people that it drops their blood pressure and we've got to, you know, we got to be careful if, you know, and again, if, the, if they're doing fine on a beta blocker, I'm just not going to switch them. I mean, and if things are doing all right, we'll just keep it at what they were taking. But I think that slowly we will, you know, start using it. But again, you don't want to switch everybody to that drug because yeah, there've been trials, there've been some studies, but when you look at the scheme of things, it's still not a tremendous number of patients uh, taking beta blockers. Now, I got some data yesterday that uh, for metoprolol succinate, there were like about 68 million people being prescribed that drug per year in this country. That's a lot of people. And, you know- 68 million? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I have it written. Yeah, I, that was, I mean, it was, there was a lot of people, you know, it's a lot of, it's the eighth most commonly used drug in the country. I think it was 68 million. I think that was it. Wow. But it, was, it was it was the most eighth most commonly used drug in the country. So, um, you know, um, I, I just think that we don't want to just run off and just start giving it uh, mevacampin. Mm -hmm. They want to be got to be careful. Quiet. We got to be careful and got to know where you know, as time goes on, we'll find people who may not tolerate it. And we'll have a better idea about that as time goes on. But what we don't want to do is give it to a lot of people and suddenly find, oops, we got a problem. And just be a little cautious. Slow onboarding. That's right. Data collection. That's right. We don't talk often about phase four trials, which right. are basically long-term observation. That's so right. we're going to need to be collecting a lot of data for a long time to see how this works. That's right. That's right. And so particularly else, since this one is a is so different than anything we've ever used before. I'm not it's saying it's bad. bad. I'm just saying we got to be cautious. As I said, cautious optimism, right. not unbridled enthusiasm. Right. It's let's stay in the middle of the balance beam. Let's be wide eyed and ask good questions and look at data carefully and trust the science right. and be patient. Um, I have people who are contacting me just this week saying, well, I'll just wait for the meds while they've got a gradient of 160 and they're symptomatic. 
they'll just wait for it to be available rather than going through surgery. I think that's not wise right now. No, I think not you at all. Care of you today, not with the hope of something that might or might not be available. And if it becomes available, it may not be available to you for a period of time due to these reimbursement issues, et cetera. So please take care of you today. We have great hopes for tomorrow, not only this drug, but there's two or three other things that are pipeline that I can't talk to you about yet, but I will be able to talk to you about it soon. So there's exciting things coming. And if you had to pick a time to come to the stage in HCM as a patient and say, okay, this is my world now, you picked a good time because we've got some more options here than we had 25 years ago. Okay, we have another question coming in and we have two more questions coming in. Um, Kyle, my center of excellence cardiologist recently said it's gonna try me, try and get me feeling better. Very surprised to hear. For me, I'm non-obstructed, was on metropolol, had symptoms related to brain fog. What might be a next best option for um, dosage and ineligibility for Mike? Okay. And so he was so, on Kyle, we really can't get into specific details on your case, but I will ask Carrie this question. If a non-obstructed patient is feeling terrible on beta blockers, uh, severe brain fog, fatigue, usual side effects, where would you pivot them to next for a non-obstructed symptomatic person? I'd, I'd go with uh, diltiazem or cardizem. So we'll move them to a calcium channel blocker. Right. Right. If the symptoms aren't resolved with a calcium channel blocker, maybe an ACE ARB. Right. They're not right. obstructed. Right. And you have, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox. Yes, we're borrowing the tools from our neighbors in heart disease, but beta blockers do work really well for a lot of people. Calcium right. channel blockers work really well for a lot of people. Disapyramide works well for a subset of the population with obstruction. And when you get into like my heart was this end stage or non-obstructed symptomatic space, there are other options. Um, they're just not as common, but the ACE ARB thing can work. You just want to make sure that there's truly no obstruction because if you start using ACE ARBs and vasodilators right. and you're obstructed, your obstruction is going to get worse. Right. So I need to manage that. Briefly, can you touch on other meds used in this in, in HCM, such as anticoagulants and um, diuretics? Well, we use uh, um, we use the anticoagulants if there's a problem with atrial fibrillation. And again, the the uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation is changing somewhat. Um, the reason that I've gone sooner to surgery, if I see obstruction with atrial fibrillation is that problem is as the left atrium gets larger, it gets harder to treat the atrial fibrillation. That is, you know, you, you, well, you do something like what we call cardioversion where you shock, shock the heart back into a regular rhythm. What we find over time is that we have to do that more frequently because the left atrium is getting larger and, uh, you know, we want to we want to keep somebody in a regular rhythm as long as we can, and we don't want to scar that heart because the the atrium is getting larger. The larger it gets, the harder it is to control the rhythm, and then you then you left with chronic atrial fibrillation. So we want to try to avoid that if we can. So we're getting a little more aggressive than we had been, you know, early on, and and where we are, you know, we'll. We'll try to do what we can. If we're starting to see a you know, few episodes of atrial fibrillation, say, or even if there's bad obstruction and they have an episode of atrial fibrillation, I'm op we're now operating. But you know, by the, if somebody's coming to see me and they they uh, they've had numbers of episodes of atrial fibrillation before they saw me and they have obstruction and the left atrium is large, we're going to go to surgery. So we're the the op because because what we we want to avoid is long term anticoagulation if we can because that in itself has side effects like GI bleeding and strokes and things like that bleeding into the brain and stuff like that so we don't want to we don't want to have to do that if we don't have to so we're let we're me clarify that point for just a second 
For those with atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation is necessary to avoid clot and stroke. Right, right, However, right. long-term sure. use of anticoagulants can lead to brain bleeds, right. uh, astro bleeds, and bruising and other right. traumatic right. injury. Right. Okay. right. Just clarifying that. Right. So I'll pause there for a second just to kind of give everybody this reset moment. When we think about HCM, we automatically think of left ventricle and thick heart. That's a little naive in thinking because it's more complex than that. The same cells that made your ventricle made your atria. Now you don't see thickening in the atria, but you do see a thinning in HCM in the atria and a, and a dilation of the left atrial cavity, part because of the back pressure, but there's hypothesis to say the cell structure there is wrong as well. And how the cell structure is wrong may affect that ventricle differently, but your HCM isn't just in your ventricle. The DNA, the cell structure that is your heart made the atria and the ventricle. So the whole heart's a little wonky. It tends to work pretty well for a really long time if managed well. One of the questions in the community this week was, how old's the oldest person you know with HCM? I know a person who's 100 years with HCM, literally a 100-year-old with HCM, and critically important, many, many patients are in their 80s. So long life is possible with good management. Uh, I'll pivot back to you for just a brief touch on diuretics and when we should be using diuretics in HCM. Well, if we see people that uh, uh, develop a, a severe shortness of breath and we can document uh, that they've got congestion in their lungs or they've got peripheral swelling, we'll give them diuretics. Clearly, if they get, if, if they're the, uh, the 70% that have resting or provocable obstruction and they were to go into heart failure, we treat that acutely. And that, but that's an indication again to do surgery if they have obstruction. It becomes more complicated if they are non obstructed and they have go into heart failure. Then we're using the diuretics chronically. We are uh, using these other vasodilators to try to treat that heart failure to lower the pressures in the lungs. But if you run into a severe problem and you start seeing they need lots of diuretics and things like that, then you, you're starting to think about a heart transplant. 5% of the transplant. I don't want the, all the people thinking no, no, that they're watching no, here. No. You're not all going there. No, no. no. It's rare. It's more common than it used to be. Right. 15 years ago, Marty Marin did a paper looking at the UNOS database. 1% of all transplants were HCM. Last year, it was up to 4% with, with HCM were transplanted. And I suspect we might grow to 6% total population as right. HCM becomes more better recognized. But um, it's it's not the common pathway. No, from no, 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 no. Okay. So I'm going to ask for a last call for questions, and then we're going to pivot to um, COVID stuff. Um, Stephanie joins us from the UK often and just has thanked us for a friendly and understandable discussion on the topic. So Stephanie, I hope you're well and hope that someday COVID goes away and I can see you again. Um, Kyle is asking back, what can we do to not feel so bad from eating? Now, Kyle, let me just go back and make sure I'm understanding this. So, okay, so this is a complicated question, not really medicine related, but if you have non-obstructed HCM and you've noticed a difference in your appetite or your ability to process food, this is a conversation you need to have with your team because nausea um, inability to eat can actually be a sign of advanced heart failure. Your gut can become fluid loaded and it, you lose your appetite and eating becomes a problem. Um, if that's the case, I would encourage you to talk to your team about maybe a consult with an advanced heart failure specialist. Harry, what would you say? Well, I would say it's interesting. People who have obstruction though, get worse symptoms after they eat because the obstruction in the heart can get worse because the blood is, when, when you're trying to digest your food, the blood in your heart gets shunted to your stomach and your intestines so that the cavity in the heart gets smaller and the obstruction can get worse. 
So that's another sign that that obstruction, if they're obstructed type, that, that they need something done about it. And I've had numbers of patients who say, you know, if I go exercise and I don't eat, I can do all right. But if I eat dinner and then I try to exercise, I got a problem. So, so uh, that's, a, that's another indication. And as a matter of fact, what I've done with a few patients who we're having trouble bringing out the gradient on a stress test, I have them eat something before they do this, an hour or so before they do the stress test. So we put more stress on the heart to see if we can cause the obstruction. So I always teach people about the testing process and I tell them not to study for the test. If you do your best when you don't eat and you've drank perfectly well and you were perfectly well rested, that's not the, sh the face you wanna show your HCM team. You wanna show what happens when I get challenged. So eat the big meal, don't perfectly hydrate if that's your normal. Don't worry about getting a perfect night of sleep before the test. You want to be you, not your best you, your average you for any testing. And that's going to help them help you manage your symptoms better. Kyle, it does sound like there's a possibility that there could be some provocable obstruction here. So right. you may want to talk to your docs about a stress echo and see if we right. can push out that gradient. If it's not related to obstruction, then we really need to take a deeper look right. as to right. why you have an appetite issue or a food processing issue associated with your heart. Okay, so those questions have quieted down. We did wanna take a few minutes, uh, which we're almost at a year of having online conversations about COVID and HCM. I think my first one was mid-March last year. So we're circling in on a year of this. Um, Harry, uh, what do you know? What are you seeing? Well, what do you think are I, best I practices? Think I think that um, because we still don't know enough about COVID uh, and the, the vaccines, I think we need to maintain uh, a caution like, like we have been doing with wearing masks and maintaining distances and stuff like that till we get a little bit more data. We need you know, maybe another couple of months just to get an idea and more people injected and not just think that the sun's out, the, we can, we got our vaccine, we can just, because, because we can go do what we want, because there are still people who will get, you know, it, it, these vaccines are not 100%. And we've got to get a little bit better idea of truly where they stand. Because if we talk again about studies, the studies on the, the two that have been released so far, you know, maybe in each study there was 15,000 people in the ones that got the placebo and 15,000 in the ones that got the, the, the active drug. So that's not a lot of people. And we're now up to uh, over 50 million people have gotten at least one shot in this country. So, you know, we, we need a little bit of time to just kind of know where we are and not just go out and, and just go to all the restaurants and all that stuff. I've felt, as a matter of fact, that now may be the time to really isolate, strange as that sounds, for another month or two so that we really knock down the virus. We really yeah. knock it down and, and take advantage of the fact that people have gotten vaccines and maybe then be, between the vaccine and isolating a little longer, we might really drop the bottom out of it. And, I, that's, and I've had occasion to talk to somebody who's an expert in pandemics and he sort of believes the same thing, that now may be the time to really you know, and, and it, particularly with now the, some of these mutations coming out, we really want to minimize more people getting this stuff because we still have questions now, how good is the vaccine going to be against some of these mutations? For the most part, it's, it still looks like it's working, but we've got to be careful and we don't want to take chances because it's a, it's a bad disease. And I think we just need to, a little bit more time. Hopefully we're Hopefully, we're all going to be able to get out there and do what we want in the not too distant future. But I think right now, we're still a little bit away from that. So, have you had your vaccine? I've had my two. I've had my two. <clears throat> I was and, tired. And my wife is getting hers next Thursday. So, particularly till she gets it for two weeks after that, we want to be careful. 
I'm one week past my second dose. I was tired after my first one. My arm hurt for a day. Um, I was tired after my second one. And then Monday night, Friday, I had it out of nowhere. I got a fever of 100.5 for about an hour and then it went away. And that was my side effect uh, so far. <laughs> so I, I just want to demystify it and take a little bit of fear away from anybody who's like, oh my God, what, what's going to happen? I don't have an immune system, folks. I'm a transplant patient. So it's a little unclear whether or not it will work as well in me as it does in Dr. Lever, who's not a transplant and has a functioning immune system. So it, there's differences to the group. Right. But a message to the HCM community, when they are prioritized in their state, and I know it's frustrating right now because the rules are all over the place. Dr. Lever, do you believe HCM patients should receive the vaccine? Absolutely. And, and, and the interesting thing is this week, the, 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 in Ohio, at least, the numbers of people getting the vaccine is significant, going up significantly. The, the federal government has now been able to ramp up the, produ the production and distribution more so than even before. They are really getting it out there. Not still as much as we want, but it, it's, you know, like I think that in Ohio, they're looking at 300,000 doses next week, which is, we were, we were grateful when we had, uh, you know, less than 100,000. We weren't grateful, I mean, but that's where we were starting. And now we're well over 300,000 just next week. So hopefully it's gonna really start. start. Um, and, and interestingly, my wife was notified by two other places. We, we're all set up for her next Thursday, but she's already been notified by two other places uh, that they, she can get the vaccine. So it's, it's coming. Yeah, I have one left in my household to vaccinate. My niece and nephew are vaccinated. My my daughter is the one who we have to get vaccinated, and it's just been a timing issue with her and work and what have you. So everybody, pretty much in my household, um, is and my my pod um, is is getting vaccinated, and, and they're doing well. No no bad side effects thus far. Now remember, my niece, nephew, and daughter all have HCM as well. So they're they're getting they're prioritized in New Jersey. And I know some other states aren't quite prioritized yet uh, for pre-existing conditions. So please be patient, get on your list and get them when you can. We have a question about, and this is just a very basic question. <clears throat> Jane, unfortunately has medication allergies. And for those with allergies to known components of one of the vaccines, obviously you should avoid it if you are seriously allergic. And that's where herd immunity comes in because no, not every single person is going to be able to take it. And like somebody with an allergy who it may be more risky for them to take this, um, I'm a transplant patient and it may not work as well in me. So I'm really depending upon the rest of the community to step up too and limit my risk by getting a vaccine themselves. I will tell you this, Jane, now allergies are allergies and they're all over the place. I have a lovely other condition that I don't talk about very much. I have idiopathic anaphylaxis. I'm allergic to something and they don't know what it is. And four times in my life, out of nowhere, my throat has closed up. And another piece of things people don't know, know Lisa actually keeps an EpiPen at her desk because I never know when it's gonna happen and it's so rare. So there's one in my purse and there's one in my desk at all times. So I have idiopathic anaphylaxis. I did not have allergic reaction to this particular vaccine. Uh, that's all I can say. I don't exactly know what I'm allergic to, though. They haven't been able to figure it out yet. So um, be safe. Any other notes to somebody who's got an allergy? No. Nope. Uh, in Ohio, does having HCM qualify for a vaccine? I don't think they know enough about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, it would be heart disease or pre-existing medical condition. They're not, they're not, they're, they're using uh, some congenital diseases. I haven't truly said, I don't, well, I'm not sure. I won't say that. I don't know what's changed in the past week. So the best thing to do is stay up on your state's Department right. of Health website because things literally change by the hour That's right. as to what's available, where, what the rules are, where, um, Oddly, in Connecticut, I know somebody who did not qualify for their medical condition, but because they work for a healthcare service, they qualified. 
even though they didn't have patient contact. So you know what, ladies and gentlemen, look for the cracks, That's find your way in, look at those rules very specifically. If you really want a vaccine I, in the next month and a half, I suspect you'll all be able to get what you and, need. And there've been cases around where all of a sudden they realized they had extra doses. So they're calling people. So always a good idea. If you know where there's a vaccine site, if you're not on the list, some of them I'm hearing are open to you dropping your name and saying, I'm available if you want to call me at the end of the day. And if there's a couple of extra doses, you might be able to onboard it that way. So um, you, you've got that. Uh, Charles is just commenting. Yes, Massachusetts specifically named cardiomyopathies as a class. So hopefully as the other states are rolling on, they're looking at best practices from other states and maybe other states will specifically listen, list it uh, cardiomyopathies. So thanks for adding that, Charles. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been another Tales from the Heart with Dr. Harry Lever. And today, I think we've cleared up some questions that people might have about medications and utilization of that. Um, we know they're not perfect, but a lot of people do really well on the known medications um, for HCM. We know that there's some interesting stuff coming down the pike. So Please stay tuned to us for more. We will be back on March 12th with Marty Marin, and we're going to be discussing something a little controversial in HCM. We're going to be talking about athletic participation and exercise in HCM, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so it, it's going to, that one's going to be an interesting conversation, and I encourage you all to join us there. Uh, and on March 11th, so the, the night before, we have our Big Hearted Warrior tour with um, Emery in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So we're going to be bringing some new faces that maybe you aren't so familiar with to the uh, forefront for our Big Hearted Warrior tour. So please join us for that. And you can sign up for those events online. And you can also sign up for our support group meetings uh, on our website at 4hcm.org. Okay, so we're going to wrap up here and we thank you very much for joining us today. Dr. Lever, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Heart. For more information on HCM, we encourage you to visit our website at 4hcm.org. Join us online for the conversation on our Facebook page or in our private group. Facebook page can be found at Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And our Instagram handle is at for HCM Warriors. That's the number four HCM Warriors. Follow us on Twitter at 4HCM.org. For those members of the LinkedIn community, you may want to follow the conversation on the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association group. Join us today. To contact the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, you can call 973-983-7429. You can email us at support at 4hcm.org or visit us online at our website 4hcm.org and send us an email from there. The Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association is located in New Jersey and operates on East Coast time. We would like to thank our sponsors, Myocardia, Invitae, Boston Scientific, and Cytokinetics for their support of this program. The HCMA is partnering with Myocardia, 23andMe, and others to help learn more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Learn more about these initiatives at 4hcm.org. Invite, a genetic testing company and a sponsor of Tales from the Heart, is proud to provide free genetic testing to families with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Please learn more at 4hcm.org. Hey, we know life with HCM can be challenging. And support is critical. That's why the HCMA has created an online support group system to help you and your loved ones live better with HCM. Join us. The HCMA is seeking volunteers on a number of different projects, including our online support group system, our peer-to-peer, -peer, Big Hearted Friends system, and our legislative subcommittee. Please visit 4HCM.org to learn more today.